Okay, we're ready. Thanks, Anna. Hello, and welcome to Prioritization, Promising Practices for Educating Others About the Importance of Disability Prioritizing and State Vaccination Plans. My name is Cassandra Thompson, and I'm the Director for Preparedness and Disability Integration at ASTO. This webinar series is brought to you by the Association of University Centers on Disability, or AUCD, ASTO, and the National Association of County and City Health Officials, or NACHO. We would really like to thank everyone for joining us today. Because of the number of participants, your audio will be muted throughout the call. However, you can also submit questions at any point during the presentations via the Q&A box in your webinar console. We have cart captioning available, and if you would like to access it, please click the CC button to view subtitles. There is also an American Sign Language interpreter in this session. You can click view on the top right corner to adjust your speaker viewing preferences. To help set the stage for understanding the origin of these webinars, our colleagues at CDC held listening sessions with a variety of jurisdictions across the US to find out some of the challenges and successful solutions each were reaching with the disabilities population. ASTO partnered with AUCD and NACHO to amplify what they learned from those sessions and host some of the jurisdictions to talk with you about what their promising practices have been so that you might be able to apply some of these ideas to your state, local, and community efforts. With that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this session so we can start hearing about successes. We will be hearing from Andy Imperato from the Disability Rights California, Rivo Mernix from the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities, Laura Sorg, also from the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. Kristen Ahrens, the Deputy Secretary, Secretary of Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. Jacqueline Sharp from the Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities. And Maya Lewis from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. So with that, I will turn it over to Andy. Great, uh, thank you, Cassandra. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So um, hi, welcome everyone. I'm honored to be part of this webinar. My name is Andy Imperato and I am the Executive Director at Disability Rights California, which is a federally funded protection and advocacy agency for people with all types of disabilities in California. I'm also a member of California's Community Vaccine Advisory Committee and um, President Biden's uh, COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Um, but I'll be primarily talking about California today. Um, so, you know, when I think about promising practices and prioritizing people with disabilities for vaccines, the story of California has been um, kind of uneven, but, but moving in a good direction. So um, one, one positive thing, uh, before the holidays, the state decided to create a community vaccine advisory committee as a way to get regular input from stakeholders, very diverse stakeholders from across the state of California to help them make hard decisions around vaccine prioritization and to help reach different populations who might be hesitant to take the vaccine. So it was kind of both purposes. And I would lift that up as a promising practice in part because um, they had a very diverse group of folks advising them, including four of us who were primarily coming from the disability community, not, not only Disability Rights California, but our State Council on Developmental Disabilities, the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, and the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund were all represented on our advisory committee. And the state, you know, started out like a lot of states saying that they wanted high risk people with disabilities to be a priority for vaccines after they did some other priority populations first, including folks who were living in nursing homes and frontline healthcare workers. Then in late January, the state decided that the prioritization system was too complicated and difficult to administer. So they wanted a simpler system and they, they were planning to do everybody over 65 as the next priority category and to wait until everybody over 65 had been offered the vaccine before they reached high risk people with disabilities under 65. And we were very concerned about that and we expressed the concern to the state and in part through the leadership of our Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Mark Galley and the governor, Gavin Newsom, 
the state changed their position and announced in the middle of February that they were going to prioritize high-risk people with disabilities starting on March 15th. Then the real issue was, okay, how do we define who is a high-risk person with disability under 65? And we advocated successfully with the state to include both big categories of people that we know are high risk by virtue of the category that they're in, and then kind of a, a catch-all category of anybody who could make an individual showing that they were high risk. So the big categories that the state of California decided to include, and this was announced just before we started moving to the high risk populations on March 15th, included everybody who gets services from a home and community-based waiver program under Medicaid. Uh, in California, we call one of those big programs our in-home supportive services program. And then also everybody with an intellectual or developmental disability who was over 16 and received services from a regional center, which is how our service delivery system is set up in California. And then um, the state also announced that people could self-attest that they were in a high risk category because of their underlying disability and they would not have to submit medical proof of that. The people that were doing the vaccinations could take self-attestation as um, enough uh, proof that somebody is in a high risk category. That last uh, um, position that the state took was based on our collective view from the disability community that self-attestation was better than requiring medical evidence. We were very concerned that if you did require medical evidence, it was gonna create equity problems for people that would have a hard time getting that medical evidence and just getting to a doctor and taking the risk associated with going to a doctor during the pandemic. Um, and the, interestingly, the California Medical Association completely agreed with us. They did not want doctors to be in the position of having to provide this medical evidence during the pandemic. So there was a confluence of the disability rights position and the position of physicians in California. So again, I mean, promising practices, we feel good about where the state ended up. We would have liked to have gotten there before March 15th, but we were glad to get there on March 15th. And now the state is in the process of really trying to work to get the vaccine to people with disabilities where they are. So the regional centers, are partnering with a number of different partners to get vaccines to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in a targeted way. We're also trying to make sure that all of the generic ways of getting vaccines are fully accessible for people with disabilities, including accessibility of the websites. That's been a challenge. One of, one of the challenges that we're having with our statewide website is it times out as people are filling in their information. And for some folks with disabilities, they need more time to fill in the information. So that's something that we've alerted the state to and are trying to work with them on. Um, the state has been partnering with independent living centers to reach out to the populations that are served by those centers. And there's just a lot of other outreach that's happening in rural areas and other parts of the state. So it's very much of a work in progress. Our governor has announced that um, Starting on April 1, uh, everybody over 50 is eligible. So I'm actually personally, I'm 55 and I'm personally getting my first vaccine today, this afternoon. Um, and then starting on April 15th, um, everybody who's over 16 will be eligible for the vaccine. So like a lot of states, we're moving quickly to broad eligibility and then we're doing targeted outreach and trying to make sure that our generic vaccination sites are fully accessible for folks with disabilities. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A and I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. I really appreciate your comments. Now we will have Rivo Mernix from the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. Uh, good afternoon or good morning uh, or wherever you are uh, in, across the United States. My name is Rivo Mernix. I'm a Chief Strategy Officer with the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. And I'm honored to share um, Ohio's journey and experience with, with our vaccine strategy. Um, appreciate Andy's comments and especially with the outreach um, efforts that are really critical as we address in Ohio, I'll be speaking about the intellectual developmental disability population. Um, 
piece that I like to focus on on the first part of the slide is really that Ohio's, I think, success in, in helping address vaccine rollout to this population is really that we're a state supervised county administered state. Um, we have our executive director reports directly to the governor. So having that direct line really helped us. Um, we, we Data planning, focus and coordination was critical at the out outset um, at a time that we didn't even know when the vaccine would be available. Fortunately, it came in December. Um, we were already planning in November, hearing from advocacy groups sharing um, tangible data and information. Um, obviously, New York Times you know, did some very in-depth articles about the high-risk nature of people with intellectual developmental disabilities and using that information, sharing it with Ohio's Vaccine Preparedness Office um, early in November um, helped us get into the priority of phase 1A um, for congregate for individuals um, residing in congregate settings, as well as their staff. And um, on the next slide, I will, I will share with you a little bit more in-depth detail of what we defined as congregate settings. Um, data sharing and planning also occurred with our county boards of developmental disabilities. They were integral. We recognized from the get-go uh, that their relationships with local health departments was crucial in helping us execute the administration of the vaccine um, with many of these individuals with mobility issues, um, we knew that you know, that was going to be a factor. Um, and you know, the governor's priority, you know, Governor Mike DeWine's priority is really about saving lives, reducing hospitalizations and balancing that with equity. Um, next slide. So getting down into the phase 1A uh, where we prioritized, uh, we identified 17,500 individuals um, residing in 1,000 state licensed settings and 3,800 non-licensed settings. Um, we have 400, 425 intermediate care facilities and 600 plus waiver homes. And the licensed waiver homes usually, even though the majority are four plus, there are several of license waiver homes if they're part of a larger network that may only have two or three people residing in them. Um, 250 of the licensed settings actually participated in the federal pharmacy program. So that was actually addressed through the federal partnership that they had with in our state, it was CVS and Walgreens and Absolute Pharmacy. Um, we did have, we, our advantage was through our license settings, we had the intimate knowledge at the state level of who resided in which, in which facility and were able to share those, that information with our county boards of developmental disabilities. So when execution needed to occur in administering, we knew who the settings were um, and who the contacts were at those settings so that those health departments could go out there and coordinate clinics uh, for those that had did not have mobility issues. Um, for the non-licensed settings, that was a little more challenging, but I think you know, our strategy of addressing this early on in December, sharing our address match lists, we started with that, sharing that with the local county boards, all 88. We had pretty much 85 out of the 88 responded you know, within a week's time verifying the lists, whether, you know, we did not include families in, in this, in that phase 1A, but for people in two plus settings, we did. And um, ultimately, you know, we know at the state level, the challenge for us having decentralized data, we did not have the advantage of knowing the apartment buildings that some, some people may reside in, but that's where the local um, partnerships came in. And really the coordination between our providers and, and county boards really was integral in, in making this happen. Um, vaccine was allocated for those staff, we estimated as a, at a three to one ratio. So then what wound up happening once we provided the numbers to the vaccine prepared in this office, um, their allocations were based on the information that we provided them. And the lists were shared um, concurrently with both the local health departments and the county boards of developmental disabilities. 
um, to make this execution. And I would say it went very, very smoothly. I think there may have been only one hiccup where one provider thought they were actually part of the federal pharmacy program and there was a delay in getting them the vaccine um, because of their misunderstanding. So other than that, I, I mean, I, you know, this was probably, you know, in public service, um, you know, my 25 plus years, this was probably one of the most, you know, rewarding experiences I've, I've had in helping people um, in this, you know, time of pandemic. Um, I'm going to, you know, obviously going first, you know, it has its advantages, um, but also hesitancy is something that has to be considered as well at the onset. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, our medical director, Dr. Laura Sorg. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you so much, Rivo, for kicking off those slides. So as Rivo mentioned, my name is Dr. Laura Sorg, and I have the privilege of serving Ohio as the medical director for the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. Um, I'm also a practicing family physician for the past 14 years and a proud autism mom. So it, you know, my role as medical director is one of, uh, you know, health, but also advocacy. And that's where I think all of your important roles probably really shined, excuse me, shown throughout all of this. So next slide, please. And I really want to highlight the important roles of those throughout Ohio and how they truly served as advocates during this time. Um, we did a lot of planning, which was, again, Rivo's you know, forte and his group. Um, we did a lot of outreach. And as Rivo mentioned, our director, Jeff Davis, has a cabinet level position with the governor's office, with Governor Jawine. And so I think that level of outreach was just remarkable during this time. He was able to highlight different journal, journal articles, excuse me, from, again, um, throughout the world, things published in the New York Times to make sure that the governor was aware and able to advocate the, for those with developmental disabilities. We then also, as Rivo said, addressed some vaccine hesitancy. And I'm sure that was probably evident across the US in many of your own states. We had people that were um, excited, surprised to be at the front of the line um, with their developmental disability, but they were also a little hesitant. And so we tried to address that in a variety of ways. Um, we looked at education and outreach, and we wanted to make sure to target specific audiences and also make sure that we were able to, again, advocate for them in the way that they needed to be advocated for. So we looked at things from an audiovisual standpoint, from messaging, also looked at, um, again, other ways through a communication with county boards, with um, individuals and natural supports. So we started to do some target audiences with a variety of three webinars, as well as other messaging, and looked at individuals, again, those congregate care settings of two or more, which is a pretty unique definition, um, family and natural supports, direct service professionals, and then we also looked at our county boards and other stakeholders. And so what had emerged early in the pandemic, as all of us were going to Zoom like we're at today, um, were these weekly COVID-19 coordination meetings. And so these weekly coordination meetings, which were you know the same time every Wednesday, allowed very smooth transition and smooth communication between all of these different groups. So we had county boards, Boards, who obviously with their SSAs, you know, again, were on the ground, knew what was going on. We have representatives from, again, self-advocacy groups like the ARC, also looking at OPERA, and then also some of the groups representing intermediate care facilities. So we try to look at everything and sit at the same table, if you will, virtually, so that we could talk through different maybe problems or issues that came up. So we were able to engage those stakeholder groups representing the parties listed above. Um, and it allowed, again, that ease of use, ongoing discussion, troubleshooting the process, 
ability to really refine those plans and clarify concerns. So two concerns really popped out to me, and those were we had a lot of questions of what happens if someone is more of a homebound individual, if they can't make it to um, a county board office or a city department of health. And so trying to identify what do we do in those case scenarios to get to the people where they're at and get to the individual to make sure we have equitable vaccine distribution. We also um, found a little bit of a crunch with addressing our 16 to 18 year old population. There were a number of counties or cities that maybe had Pfizer or Moderna. And so if one had Moderna as the vaccine manufacturer, they may not be able to vaccinate then a 17 year old. And so we were able then um, along with Governor DeWine and Director Davis to advocate and have those individuals receive the vaccine at our um, different children's hospitals throughout the state. So again, those types of things were brought to the table, allowed people and different stakeholder groups to advocate and then it really enhanced ongoing communication efforts. One of the things that we recognized is it's wonderful to be able to have all these seats at the table, to have voices at the table, and to be able to use that momentum through the pandemic, but afterwards in order to enhance the lives of those with disabilities. So thank you so much for having us today, and I look forward to the questions. Thanks so much for sharing, Ohio. Next, we are gonna hear from Kristen Ahrens from the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. Hi, and thanks so much for having me. Um, I've got a couple of slides here as well to share. Um, and uh, just in the, the story for us in terms of prioritizing people with disabilities and caregivers in our vaccine distribution plans, is really a story of data, data, data. Um, I think you just heard from Ohio a couple of references to the New York Times um, articles, the, the data they had collected, which showed the extraordinary vulnerability um, for people with intellectual developmental disabilities to contracting COVID and to, uh, to death from COVID. Um, so we had started uh, when the pandemic began um, we we uh, looked at a, a way to collect data that gave us as close to real time information um, for the people that are enrolled for home and community based services um, and for intermediate care for services in in Pennsylvania. Um, and part of the the need for that was really so that we had situ situational awareness so that we could uh, intervene and support providers uh, wherever the outbreaks were happening. Um, so what we did is we looked at the systems that we already had in place for uh, quick data exchange with providers. Um, so we added into our incident management system uh, a way to collect information on COVID infections for individuals built into a, another uh, system that we have that providers were already reporting in and very familiar with, uh, a quick way for providers to report staff uh, COVID infections. What came of this is not only did we have data to be uh, have that situational awareness, to be doing interventions and really managing outbreaks uh, throughout our community system, uh, it also provided us when it came time for um, policy making, um, when it came time to make decisions about Pennsylvania's vaccine allocation, um, we had very good data that showed that people that um, were receiving support in our community are licensed community homes. Uh, in Pennsylvania, that primarily means homes that are one to four persons, so they're quite small. Uh, but between our community homes and our intermediate care facilities, uh, that we had very, you know, there are very high rates of, of COVID contraction uh, and very high mortality rates. Um, so this, we were able to provide this to our Department of Health and um, through the use of that data, um, showing the vulnerability of our, our whole population to COVID, um, we were able to get unpaid caregivers, all paid caregivers, so all direct support professionals, regardless of the setting that they worked in, um, into 1A. Uh, we got all uh, participants in our program that received services in a congregate setting, including those small congregate settings in 1A, 
uh, everyone else that receives services uh, through our system. Again, given the data, we could really show the um, level of contraction and the sheer risk for people. Uh, we were able to get all everyone uh, that was known to our system into uh, the priority for 1B. So I think for, for us, the kind of the takeaway, um, in addition to having a really good foundation for that prioritization within our, our plan, um, was that we, uh, next steps as we are thinking about um, through an after action review for this pandemic, uh, how, do we, how do we have this, um, these data collection systems built in, uh, in a way that we can start immediately. We missed three, four weeks uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, so not bad. Um, but I think we can anticipate that this will not be the only public health emergency or the only natural disaster that we need to respond to. So we are in process of uh, building um, the reporting system that will be able to collect that data uh, immediately, that will be able to very quickly uh, change that data collecting uh, collection system so that we always have this kind of data for not only that situational response um, to the immediate situation at hand, but also to um, looking when we do have policy making decisions um, where we need input. Um, again, the data was absolutely invaluable. And you can go ahead to the next slide here. Um, the other uh, piece um, that we were asked to highlight from Pennsylvania was how we educated um, people about essentially what was in the, the vaccine plan. Um, and I'm guessing Pennsylvania's plan was like most states. Uh, we all work from the, the template that was provided from the federal government that um, covered lots and lots of um, areas related to vaccine allocation and distribution. And uh, when we looked at you know, how, how the vaccine prioritization groups fell out, it's pretty complicated, right? You've got even within a phase, you've got multiple groups within a phase, and then you have uh, really discrete levels of you know specific specificity within different industries, um, because we all knew that the um, availability of vaccine in that early part of the pandemic was so limited. So really, a complicated plan, uh, probably like most states. Um, so one of the areas, you know, I think that kind of got lost in, in all of that initially was that unpaid caregivers were in there. They were in clearly in phase 1A along with all of our direct support professionals. And so how do we get that word to vaccine providers? How do we make sure that unpaid caregivers are aware of that? And how do you document that? You know, initially our vaccine providers were looking for an employee, you know, an employee pass or relationship with an employer, um, a provider with our direct support professionals. So the Commonwealth developed um, a, a letter uh, essentially from our secretary explaining for vaccine providers uh, that unpaid caregivers fell into uh, prioritization group 1A and, uh, and that uh, caregivers could go to the, our Department of Human Services website attest that they were a caregiver, grab that letter and produce that as documentation that they were, they are an unpaid caregiver and fell into 1A. Um, so I think, you know, that, that's been helpful in, in trying to make sure that people, uh, unpaid caregivers are getting to the front of the line. Um, what, what I would say where we are now, um, Pennsylvania is at, um, you know, we're getting to, to very close to half of our adult population at this point is, is vaccinated. Um, and what we are finding uh, is that we have, for our population, our objective is that everyone that is known to us has access to the vaccine. So we've got, you know, we're getting to a broader place of access. Uh, we will have, as of um, next week, we will be opening up into phase two. So basically all, you know, all adults uh, in Pennsylvania will have access to vaccine. Um, so how do we make sure that people who have those additional barriers to getting vaccine um, have, have that availability? And um, so we're going to be working through our support coordinators to make sure that they have uh, whatever support they need to get to if they haven't been able to go to one of our closed clinics um, that we can get people um, to a, a vaccine provider in their area. But it really does take that kind of personal touch in many cases to get over the hesitancy to get over uh, any barriers that are in people's way to get vaccine. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, for your comments and for your leadership. Now we will have Jolene Sharp from the Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to be here with you today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this from a different role. The Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities, as many of you know, many of you are familiar with councils on developmental disabilities, we are a systems change organization within state government. So we're not actually de um, delivering direct services, which means um, our perspective on this is a little bit different than some of the agencies who are actually really responsible for the distribution of the vaccine. So as we were entering into the vaccine distribution plan, um, we took a hard look at what our best role was gonna be. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we were able to assist, but I'm gonna give a little background. Tennessee was the first state in the nation to prioritize people with intellectual and developmental disabilities for vaccine group 1A1. And there were a few reasons um, that we were able to do that. Um, one of the key factors was, and I think this has been mentioned um, previously, we have a cabinet level developmental disabilities agency in Tennessee. So Tennessee's Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities was in the room at the table where decisions were being made about vaccine, vaccine prioritization. And they were really able to speak in that, at that table about the need for prioritizing people with uh, IDD. So they were right there in those discussions, helping to make those decisions. And that obviously makes a huge difference, that representation at that table. Um, so Tennessee made the addition of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to that group 1A1 on December 27. <laughs> so as you can imagine, um, it wasn't hard for folks to miss that information, to miss that update. It was published on page 15 of a 52 page state distribution plan, and it definitely was not written in plain language. There were some math symbols that were used that caused some confusion about the age bracket that this applied to. And we just, almost within, within about three days, the council was starting to hear from some of our council members and um, our network of partners and policymaking graduates and contacts all throughout the state that there was just a lot of confusion about this. And in addition to the community itself having confusion, we were hearing, we were beginning to hear stories of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who were now eligible, who were being turned away at their local health departments because that information just hadn't yet penetrated all the way down to where those vaccines were being delivered. So the council decided to um, pitch in we knew that our you know, Department of Health and DIDD folks were just so busy um, with the logistics of getting these vaccines out to folks that we offered to step in. And we developed a two page front and back document that was just a real quick memo that pulled the information out about eligibility for people with IDD and put it in very plain language and we um, then shared that with the agencies and they approved it. And we were able to use the Department of Health and DIDD logos on this document to really give it that full weight and credibility. And then they actually helped distribute that to people in services, but also to the local health departments, which again was really important to make sure that the folks actually delivering those vaccines knew about changes to the eligibility criteria. So this memo, um, was something families could print out, people with IDD could print out and take with them, but it was also being distributed through Department of Health and DIDD channels to folks who were really taking the responsibility for delivering the vaccines. So that um, immediately helped to kind of clear up some of the confusion about who was eligible. Because the council is kind of in this bridge role where we can help connect folks in the field who are living these daily experiences with the bigger cabinet level agencies, we were really able to stay in touch with our network of folks. And that gave us a window into where were the gaps, where were the issues on the ground, who still wasn't covered by the changes in eligibility and really needed to be added. So over the course of January through March, the distribution plan in Tennessee was updated three more times. 
So in January, direct support professionals um, working with adults with IDD were added. Um, and then in February, caregivers of children who were categorized as med medically fragile were added. Um, and that criteria was described in, in detail. It had to do with kids with some pretty significant health risk. Um, and so we, again, we distributed a memo with the Department of Health and the DIDD logos on it for each of these changes. And then in March, the last update that was made was, um, and this was based on specific feedback that we at the council got from the field, um, American Sign Language interpreters were added in March as a priority group. And for each of those groups, we helped um, develop a plain language memo that people could take with them to their appointments and that was also sent to those local health departments and vaccine distributors. So we used a few other strategies because the other issue that we were seeing was that when the focus was through DIDD, communicating with people about eligibility, it was really only reaching people who are actually receiving state services. And we know that the national statistics suggest that really only about 20% of people with disabilities are actually getting services. So another question that was coming up was how do you make sure you're getting clear information to that other 80% of people so that they know they're eligible and um, you know, can go and get vaccinated also. So we worked really hard to use social media tools. We developed very short um, graphic Q and A's that could be easily shareable, just bite-sized information about who was eligible, answering some key questions about where to go, how to get your vaccine, and we use social media to distribute those and that helped folks be able to share them to a much broader network beyond those who may already be connected to services. And of course, our state agency partners really continue to help us get that word out through the Department of Health platforms. And so we really worked um, that way to get information out to the broader community. Um, and we will be continuing to work now as our state has broadened it out to all adults. Um, we'll be working very hard along with, I know many of you in every other state on overcoming that vaccine hesitancy with really clear plain language communication, making it a priority to talk to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, not just about them, and really trying to reach that broader community beyond those who are already connected uh, through services. And I think that's it for me and I'll pass the baton back. Thanks so much, Jolene, for sharing your insights. Last but not least, we will have Maya Lewis from North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. All right, thank you. Um, again, my name is Maya Lewis and I am um, with the North Carolina Division of Mental Health Developmental Disabilities and Substance Abuse Services. And so I'm gonna share some information through a different lens speaking mainly to how North Carolina educated and shared our vaccine prioritization so that individuals and families were aware of, of when it was their opportunity to, to as you can see on my, on my screen, um, their opportunity to take their shot. So from um, the beginning, again, uh, North Carolina, we had some very in, intentional and ongoing consistent stakeholder engagement with, with our community around the elements of a of, of vaccine distribution. And um, for the public, what we did, we, we have what we call again, find your spot and take your shot, which is, is a website that we have that is in English and also in Spanish that provides information on the vaccine prioritization as well as access to information about where a person can go to receive um, to receive their vaccine. It's actually an interactive tool. So individuals are able to go answer some questions about, um, about the priority um, that's used to then let them know where they fall in that priority. And so um, because North Carolina, we've had the opportunity to engage with our stakeholders through various phone calls, um, provider convenings, um, individual and family convenings, we use those opportunities throughout really the whole entire um, pandemic thus far to provide updates to families, to provide updates on what was happening 
where we were in the vaccination prioritization process and where things are just as a whole related to the pandemic. Um, in addition to that, we, we have very vocal stakeholders. And so they, they pointed out some things when, when we weren't clear on where individuals with disabilities fell, um, fell within that prioritization. You know, if it said that someone who had, um, you know, medical needs were eligible, that, you know, we had folks who raised their hand and said, does that also mean? Um, so we, we clarified along the way. We, we clarified some things related to our prioritization and made sure to expressly note um, that this included individuals with disabilities as part um, of the feedback that we heard from our stakeholders. Um, in addition to the, the website, recognizing that not everyone may have access to the website, we also had have a um, COVID vaccine help center or a call center where individuals could, can make a phone call, talk to a person and, and get their questions answered about, <clears throat> again, is it my opportunity um, to, you know, to, to take my shot? And so that has been also very useful for those who may not, again, have access to the, the internet. I um, also want to, um, to point out some of the things where with those provider convenings and having engagement with our local communities, providers, association councils, faith communities, I cannot express the, enough the importance and of having those relationships and working with those partners to make sure that commu accurate communication has been shared with the community. So it, it was those faith communities, those provider organizations, those um, other community um, partners that help to make sure individuals and families and just the community in general, not just disability, um, disability groups and disability partners, but just the community in general were aware of where we were in the vaccination um, distribution process to make sure people know where to go and how to access um, the, vac um, the vaccine when it, was, when it was their opportunity. We've taken the opportunity to um, have weekly meetings with our partners who are our vaccine providers to make sure again that we are, that we still focus and ensure that there's equitable distribution. Um, of the vaccine with the historically marginalized populations and that inclusive of disability groups, inclusive of um, working with senior um, le leadership to again, make sure that we are communicating as best we can through, the, through our website, through you know, tweets and, and posts because <laughs> we're in an age where with millennials and, and even my mom, you know, <laughs> um, following tweets and, and, and getting information that way. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So we, we do that as well. And, and we, we, we assess, we don't just say we've done it. We, we assess to make sure that the audience that we're trying to reach and making sure that the word is getting out that we're, it's actually getting out to, to the audience that um, we're wanting to make sure has this information. So we assess, we regroup and we'll continue to do so. So, but I think, um, you know, when I think about best practices and, and how in North Carolina, we have done our best to make sure people are aware of um, their opportunity, you know, because they have that, you know, they have this a spot to take their shot. Um, I cannot stress enough those state and community partnerships to help um, support with getting that information out to the masses. So thank you again for the opportunity and I am available for questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maya. Really appreciated your comments on creating partnerships with diverse communities. And thank you so much for, to all the speakers. Now we'll go to the Q&A. The first question is, if COVID has been a national emergency, why do states have different plans? Why can't all states have the same kind of plans? And I think this is for all of the speakers, if anyone has any insight into that. Well, this is Andy, I'm happy to go first. Um, you know, from my perspective, sitting in Sacramento, California, it would have been nice to have had stronger leadership from the CDC and the federal government early 
in the vaccine deployment, or really before we started deploying vaccines, where the CDC could help the states understand what data was out there. You know, the CDC came up with a list of conditions that were they considered they had scientific evidence for high risk of bad consequences if they got COVID. The CDC said that they never intended that list to be used for vaccine prioritization, but many states did use it for vaccine prioritization, and it was an under-inclusive list. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would have helped to have had stronger leadership from the CDC. We knew the vaccines were coming for months, and I just don't understand why we didn't get stronger leadership from the federal government, which I think California and other states would have appreciated. Appreciate that, Andy. Do any of the other panelists have anything else to say about that before we move on? All right. The next question I think is for Laura and Rivo. Could you please explain how local health departments were involved in working with the county boards of developmental disabilities to vaccinate? Did they play a role in setting up clinics, et cetera? Go ahead, Dr. Sword. I mean, <laughs> Sorry, we're giggling at each other, trying to read each other's body language since we know each other and work together going, are you taking this or am I? So I think it's an excellent question. Um, what we did is with those Wednesday stakeholder meetings, we were able then to work with the Ohio County Board Association when we discussed that with like, again, the DD world of board associations. It's a little confusing because we also have county boards of health and city boards of health. So oftentimes those terms would get interchanged even though they're different. We really did rely a lot on our workings with the Department of Health at the state level, as well as the interworkings, if you will, with the OACB, so that Ohio Association of County Boards, when we talk about um, individuals with DD or ID and their individual relationships. Um, oftentimes we found that the, the strength of these relationships in the months and years even prior, during, first of all, in the months prior to the vaccine during the pandemic and in years past really made a big difference. And so it's hard for us to ever imagine anything prior to a year ago because it feels like we've been living with, you know, in this time of COVID forever. But back in like 2008, 2009, there was the H1N1 flu pandemic. It was kind of a mini pandemic, if you will, or epidemic in comparison. But there were also efforts at that time in order for vaccines to be um, distributed, et cetera. So we oftentimes use the strength of those pre-existing relationships. And if there were any kind of sticking points, then with those different city or county health departments, we were able to, on the state level, kind of you know negotiate or figure out those sticking points with our county and regional teams. So yeah, I, I, could, I could, yeah, I could tell you that several of the county boards had pre-existing relationships with, and actually sat on their local health planning, and even leading up to the vaccine uh, distribution, many of them were involved in emergency planning when when PPE was the the thing that was critical in spring and summer of last year. So um, many of them had pre-existing relationships. The local health departments went into the homes of individuals when called upon. They had the addresses. So um, I, I think you know. Some and then where relationships didn't exist, they were kind of fostered and forged. So thank you so much for those comments. The next question is for all the panelists. What strategies have been utilized for getting vaccines to those that are truly homebound and live in non-licensed living arrangements? So Cassandra, I was actually going to also take that one as a physician, if that's okay, at least for Ohio. Um, so yes, yeah, so in Ohio, again, utilizing those um, already existing relationships or fostered relationships that happened, um, you know, again, kind of organically throughout the COVID pandemic, um, oftentimes county and city boards of health 
actually reached out to county boards of DD and said, who is truly homebound? Um, and they also reached out to individual physicians that were community-based physicians and would call them and say, who do you know that is truly homebound? Do you know their address, their best contact information? So that was one way. And then there was also a lot of grassroots advocacy amongst individuals, right? And families saying, hey, we need help. I, you know, maybe whether that is a physical, you know, part of a disability, or if that was an intellectual disability that made it difficult to get out, they to go to, let's say, a pharmacy or wait in line at a county board, et cetera. They were able to foster those and truly reach people in their own homes. Um, some of the different areas throughout the state even have mobile units. For instance, Ohio Northern University has a mobile unit where they actually took what looked like an RV and went door to door. So pretty unique, unique um, and pretty interesting and definitely helpful during the pandemic. So this, this is, this is Maya Lewis, I, just to add to that, that question. So in, in North Carolina, we actually um, engaged with those home health um, agencies, those agencies that we know would engage with individuals who may be homebound. So we, we engage with over 220 different providers to help identify those individuals who would who would who are actually homebound. So our veterans um, administration organizations, uh, aging community, home health, you name it, it was a provider that we we engaged with to identify those those individuals. And then from that information that we learned, we worked and partnered with them to actually get vaccine to them in their home, which was it was the most ideal way to, to do that. And for those when that did not work, we, we provided some partnerships with transportation and things like that to support them getting to vaccine events that may have been happening in their community. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maya and Laura. And I, for Pennsylvania, we um, we are still working on the solution for that. Part of that is um, we're still in kind of the final process of identifying all of those individuals throughout uh, the Department of Human Services. And then um, I think the approach that we're, we're looking at is uh, to look at mapping all of those individuals, regardless of program that they're involved in. Um, whether it's through services because they're aging or whether it's through services because they have an intellectual disability um, and doing some mapping uh, where we do have, we are a large rural state. Uh, we have large urban areas, but we also have uh, really large rural areas. And so um, there are obviously challenges that come with both of them. Uh, we have some solutions. Uh, we've got a, a county department of health um, that is using uh, their emergency management uh, to go out and do uh, home visits for individuals who um, cannot leave to go to a clinic. Uh, but for the remainder of the state at this point, we are still working through solutions on that. Thanks so much, Kristen. Are there any specific or unique considerations regarding vaccination for dually eligible individuals with disability? And this is for all of the panelists. Can I ask a clarifying question? Are duly eligible meaning Medicare and Medicaid? I think so, but um, it's unclear the question. Okay, I'll, I'll answer it in that regard. Um, for in, in Pennsylvania, we do have um, through, we have a community health choices uh, run through our department. Um, that does have a program for people who are duly eligible. Um, they, we had asked, it's a managed care program. We asked the managed care organizations to go through, identify all of their sort of highest risk individuals. Uh, and then we worked with um, a pharmacy partner, established clinics, uh, a number of large clinics, uh, closed uh, point of distribution clinics across the Commonwealth. Um, and then worked uh, to get people to that, including um, you know, supporting them with transportation, care to get there, et cetera. So that was uh, one, one way we have tried to get to that population. The second um, way is now all of those managed care, our physical health managed care organizations and our managed care organizations that serve our physical disabilities and aging population uh, are now paired with vaccine providers um, to make sure that the entirety of that population has access to vaccine. 
Thanks so much, Kristen. I don't know, Laura, if you were going to give an answer to this one as well. I, what I was going to say is, um, again, it was just that clarifying question of duly eligible, if it was Medicaid, Medicare, from a duly eligible, if that person intended it to be um, duly eligible based on the presence of IDDD plus another qualifying condition regarding health, um, that is something that I know several states, I think, that are on the panel today had done. And in Ohio, that was something that was done very clearly um, on NG. January, where individuals that would, were duly eligible from a developmental disability standpoint with a high risk condition, um, such as epilepsy, cerebral palsy, et cetera, that they were placed, if you will, um, at the front of the line because of the concern regarding the risk and them having, if you will, double jeopardy of two high risk conditions. Thanks so much, Laura. I appreciate that. Looks like we have time for one more question. Did agencies have to ask each homebound person before giving their name and address to the public health departments? This is for anyone um, who answered on the homebound question. So I, again, I'm not sure what others were doing for for our personal um, use in the state, if departments of health contacted um, local um, DD, um, you know, again, boards or contacted physicians, that um, board physician or other representative in turn asked first, if that makes sense, prior to giving out the information. So it was asked to make sure that it was okay to release that info prior to um, distribution. Yeah, and we and, and because it was a public health emergency and our departments of health um, you know served the role of, of vaccine, we were able to share information on that level as well. Can hear you. Thank you, Hannah. And thanks so much, Laura and Rivo. As we close out, we do have a couple of announcements. We are excited to report that the White House and the Department of Health and Human Services announced that CDC and ACL will be partnering together to issue nearly $98 million in grants to the aging and disability networks in every state and territory to help provide critical services to overcome barriers that are preventing people with disabilities and older adults from receiving vaccines. Part of these funds will also support a national hotline to assist people with disabilities and older adults in registering for vaccination and to connect them with local disability and aging agencies that can provide services and supports necessary to access them. For more information about CDC's COVID-19 work related to people with disabilities, visit their disability toolkit that includes vaccination considerations for people with disabilities, guidance for how to equitably provide vaccine, and how vaccine sites can focus on accessible solutions. We encourage you to seek out these resources for yourself and share them with your networks. Thank you so much again for attending this webinar series.